Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. Welcome back, everybody, to Hashing It Out. Uh, I will be your host today, along with Dean. Um, I hey, everyone. Marvin. Say, what's up, everybody, Dean? What's up, everybody, Dean? I don't know if we're going to do that every time, but we're, we're going to borrow that from Corey and Colin for now. Uh, so today we have with us uh, Tarun Chitra of Gauntlet Network. Uh, introduce hey. yourself, please. Hey, uh, I'm Tarun. I'm the, the founder of Gauntlet. Uh, and I uh, have kind of been spending time trying to make the economics and, and kind of cryptocurrency land a little more interpretable. Um, but I've spent a long time working on simulation-based research and hoping to apply it to crypto uh, as people develop crazier and crazier systems. Crazier and crazier is the way of putting it. Um... So the I think the the trademark question that we ask at the beginning of this is usually, what's your backstory? Uh, how did you get into crypto? How did you get into the space? Um, so tell us about that, please. Yeah, definitely. So uh, ten years ago, I was working at a company called De Shaw Research, and we built ASICs uh, for doing uh, physics research. So ASICs. Uh, in like 2010, I'd say the majority of the people who were working in ASICs were either building it, building them for um, telecom use cases. So a lot of like custom for FFT, like high throughput FFT devices for, uh, you know, different sorts of like encoding and encryption uh, mechanisms, as well as uh you know, defense use case. But there wasn't this current frenzy where right now there's everyone and their mom trying to build an ASIC for self-driving cars, for machine learning, for crypto, et cetera. Uh, but uh, we we basically worked on, um, you know, building this crazy ASIC for doing physics research uh, with the idea of applying it to drug discovery. So we were, we were, building this simulation machine that simulated sort of the protein protein physics. And uh, yeah, so it, it, was, it, was, it was kind of this like crazy billionaire's research lab thing. And he was spending all his, his fortune on building these ASICs. And, you know, in 2010 and 11, when, when I was working there, there were a bunch of times where we would buy chip space. Um, and the way that the chip space uh, selection works is you know there's a big there's a big physical wafer and unless you are spending a billion dollars or buying a huge amount of chips uh basically tsmc and samsung and and people like that will just kind of tell you to well probably even less politely than this fuck off uh they will instead be like go talk to someone who can take a hundred different orders put them together onto one wafer and like make it economical for them at like a billion dollars. Cause like they, they really can't run their fabs economically until it's a billion dollars. So, so the way it's that like a middleman designer that integrates all these like little people who aren't important enough for their time and goes to TSMC. Uh, yeah. So, so the way, the way this works is basically you take the wafer uh, they, you cut it into blocks. So, uh, let's say one millimeter squared blocks. Um, and then you auction those blocks. So like you make a design in RTL, you synthesize your RTL, you say like, okay, this chip is going to be like 10, centi- 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. 
or the total surface area, and then you go and buy it, you tell the producer, hey, we need this much space. The producer takes your design, adds in a bunch of insulation uh, and like other like physical hardware logic to make sure that your design doesn't leak into someone else's so that when it's fab, so most fabs work by laser etching. And so you don't want the laser to accidentally, someone else's design of a gate to etch into yours. Um, and so they hold the risk of making sure that your designs don't meet. And they also are oftentimes whenever you hear US politicians complain about like China stealing our IP, it's usually this step where this happens um, often. Um, oh, wow. Because because the these uh, these integrators who put together a bunch of orders, they actually have to have more detail about like what each circuit is doing to make sure that there's like enough power in a certain place or like there's enough uh, insulation so that there's not uh, you know a tunneling event stuff like that. Maybe this is too deep on on the. Yeah, the no, like, I'm, I'm, feeling, <laughs> I'm feeling mixed because this is interesting and crazy. But yeah, this is like yeah. So, so you guys were making ASICs of ASICs essentially to bring down the cost of a single ASIC. Well, well, someone was doing this for them. Well, yeah, well, someone's someone doing it for yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so like, like until Bitmain got to a certain size, they also had to buy from the same person. And so, what happened in 2011 was one time our supplier, just who is this person who integrates these things, they we we gave them like 20 million dollars, and then they just like ghosted us and disappeared. And they disappeared for like two to three months. And, you know, when you give someone $20 million, it was still an escrow. So at least it wasn't like you gave them money and they completely ran away. Uh, they they kind of ghosted us, didn't tell us what, what they're, what's going to happen, etc. And they, uh, they basically, you know, three months later, okay, we'll give you a 10% discount. Now, when you're, you have 100 people working on a chip and you get a three-month delay because someone ghosts you, I don't think a 10% discount is uh, exactly what is going to cover that. So we, yeah. we like, we, I guess my, my work threatened to sue them and all the stuff. And in that time, that's how we found out about this Bitcoin miner, which at that time later became the people who made Avalon, um, which is one of the early Bitcoin miners. Long story short, I was like, people are willing to pay $20 million to buy up chip space. I should go mine this thing because this seems crazy. So it's they like, jumped, like they a, cut the line, like the delay was because this provider was like, oh no, these people are like, these, these, this Bitcoin mining producer was willing to outbid you so that they would bump you off and screw you over just so they could get a few extra, like some more lead time on, on the hash war. Yeah, exactly. Um, wow. So, you know, like I said, I, you know, right now, if you go to this, a similar supplier, uh, it's extremely competitive and you're waiting for, for months because of self-driving car LiDAR, because of like TPU, ML chips, like people building special purpose embedded chips for doing machine learning, uh, plus crypto like mining devices. Um, but back then there was no one. So we weren't used to this level of like aggressive competition. And so when I, when we saw that, I was just like floored and was like, I need to go mine a bunch of Bitcoin. Because I need to understand what this thing is if there's like all these people in China going crazy about this, um, who we work with. And yeah, I mined a bunch. And then 2013, there was like a big crash and I just sold everything and was like, I'm never gonna, never gonna be interested in this, this stuff again. And then 2015, um, the paper, uh, by Sampolinsky and Zohar on Ghost, uh, greatest, heavy, heaviest, uh, greedy heaviest observed subtree came out and that was the first time i was like oh okay this thing makes sense theoretically because having worked in distributed systems i was like i don't really understand why this works a lot of the probability theory that is used is wrong like intro probability of like understanding how poisson distributions work was wrong in like the early papers and forum posts and stuff like that uh and so i was like okay this this is just a bunch of crackpots and then that paper convinced me that there's actually this safety and liveness guarantees that are probabilistic and, and real. And like the proofs made a lot of sense and it seemed like it was, it was rigorous. And that was when I started really paying attention to academic literature. Um, fast forward a little bit in 2016, I went and worked in high frequency trading uh, and we were doing simulations of, you know, 
trading strategies against you know, models of the market. And at that time, proof of stake was first coming out. And that's when I, I was reading a lot of these like Algorand or not proof of stake was first coming out, right? Of course, there's pure coin and NXT and stuff, but, um, like credible that, attempts. Again, yeah, maybe I, 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 because I was coming from like a more academic place as this research place where like, you know, I, I was like, oh, okay, like I needed to see the stamp of approval of Sylvia McCauley. I mean, now I feel the opposite. I'm kind of like, you know, oftentimes the, the luster of the famous person is not, is a negative. <laughs> but I, I, I saw the Algorand paper and I, I spent a lot of time reading it. Uh, the first version was way too long. It was like 130 pages, and then they finally cut it down to like their 20 page submission. Uh, but that was when I was really like, okay, this, the cryptography is amazing, but people are making derivatives and they're not pricing that in into their 51% model. Um, and yeah, I just started working on writing a bunch of, of code to, to, to value, figure out how to value the derivatives that were implicitly being created in proof of stake. Um, and the reason I say it's a derivative is, is, you know, in proof of stake, you bond an asset, you lock up an asset and you get payments probabilistically, right? If you get slashed, you lose a payment. If you get a block, you win a payment. You also get transaction fees, which are probabilistic. Uh, but then you also only get your principal at the end if you can unbond. But there's a sense in which if everyone unbonds at the same time and the network holds some liabilities, you might not actually get back all of your principal because of slashing events or dilution events or, or things like that. And so it looks a lot like a, a swap in some sense where you put principal up, up front, you get these recurring payments. And at the end, if, if everything matches up, you get your principal back. And I just like hadn't, I was you know looking at this and I was like, in proof of work, you don't have that unless you have derivatives on your ASICs and like cash power derivatives and, and P, those are so illiquid that it, it doesn't factor into how people value these things. So you kind of have this like hybrid, like, like sounds like a very unique hybrid of experiences that, uh, and you come across these ideas being spoken about in, in one language, you know, and which is uh, like distributed computing. But you also have this experience working in high frequency trading and finance. And so like you, I mean, was it, what did they talk about derivatives in this paper or was this sort of a, it mapped in the model in your mind from, uh, from proof of stake to, and you, you sort of intuitively thought about it as, um, that sort of financial uh, mechanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's I know I went on a very long winding tangent, but uh, yeah, that's really a good, don't worry. Really, that's that's a good question. I think it, I think it's like I didn't totally realize it when I was reading these papers. I was reading them out of like you know, I was reading them on the subway on the way to work because like that it was just like oh, they're interesting, distributed systems thing. I think when I first realized that there there was this derivative aspect with some former coworkers of mine uh went and raised a lot of money to do a stable coin and i was i was like this is nuts and at that time they were like we're gonna make a, a layer one chain we're gonna have this proof of stake thing and I, I read their paper they like sent it to a bunch of people before and that was the first time i was like they they i think actually really were the first people who i had seen have writing about writing anything about these assets as being derivative um, but I think that was when it really hit me. It was like this, the idea that the layer one chain would have a stable coin attached to it is like the only way that works is, is kind of adding in these, these synthetics. Um, and yeah, it just kind of, so, so where does that get, like, what, what is it that you, I think that like kind of clarifies where you're coming from the backstory. What are you doing now with it? Like what's yeah. the, what, what, what is it that you're using that insight for and working on these days? Yeah, so it, it, in, 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 in algorithmic finance, um, you know, a lot of the problems you work on are don't have sort of closed form analytic math solutions. Um, and you're, you're really, you have to resort to numerical methods, uh, mainly simulation, to try to get an idea of what is the expected outcome, what's the average outcome, what's kind of the 95% worst case outcome, 
how much risk do I hold, stuff like that. You can't just say like, oh, I'm going to hold $5 for risk at the end of the day. Uh, you can say, however, I'm holding, I probably will hold $5 for risk, but there's a 2% probability that I owe someone $10. Uh, and those methods, I think, are very important as a complement to you know, smart contract auditing and security auditing to find out if there are, are incentive issues and bugs in these in contracts that come from how people use them rather than like statistically, like behaviorally, then they then like one plus one equals five. And if I re-enter this particular function call, I can take all the money. And basically I, I worked on those tools for more or less a decade in, in different ways. And I thought that, oh, people were building these systems, but they're not stress testing them against this stuff. And so, yeah, I, we, at Gauntlet, we, we've kind of built a bunch of tools for building financial models directly against these smart contracts. So we have a custom version of like an Ethereum client that we made uh, that's like optimized towards stress testing different things. And we run, you know, millions of simulations against the protocols and say like, here's a different set of outcomes. Here's the probability of certain bad things happening, good things happening. And if you tune these parameters, you, you know, you, here's how you change the probability of certain outcomes coming out. Uh, so, so we really work on, on stress testing this. We initially were working on a lot of proof of stake uh, type of stuff, but I think nowadays, you know, proof of stake in practice seems to be a, a, a dinosaur that ossifies very quickly and no one is willing to change the network. You know, like everyone's like, oh, we're going to add all these complicated governance things, but guess what? We're never going to vote on anything because we're too afraid to change, make any parameter changes once it's running versus like, you know, as, as maligned as it is, I think like the, the DeFi space is doing inventing the exact same types of assets, except they're much wilder. Uh, they're cha they're willing to change parameters, do all these crazy things with them. But that experimentation is way more interesting. Um, and it's also the place where I think you need more safety guarantees. So I just I just want to synthesize so far for any, like what what it is my understanding is like basically uh, you take smart contracts uh, somebody might come to you with a, a set of smart contracts probably DeFi stuff and um, they're not looking for you to to see if there's any bugs in it in the the sense that like a, an auditor like myself would look for um, so much as are there uh like strategies that exist in in this like as a result of this contract existing that uh, are not easy to anticipate but lead to undesirable outcomes is that maybe too yeah. bad but like a no 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 that's, that's that's a great way have you have you seen the movie office space yes of course so in office space you know there's uh there are these people who figure out this bug in their uh, employer system where they can like pay themselves a cent a penny more every day and it compounds until they take up all the company's money. That's exactly the type of attack that uh, I think you can have in the smart contract where, where a certain type of user can figure out an advantage that's not uh, perfect. Like it's a probabilistic thing. Like it's 51% of the time they can take more of a block reward than they're supposed to, than their stake allows them to. Uh, but they can, they can, you know, even though there's a bunch of variants in that strategy, like one out of five times it fails, they can still keep executing it until they slowly take more than their fair share or more than kind of the rules that like the intentions of the person who wrote the contract where that revenue was supposed to get allocated in a certain way. But someone found a strategy in which they can slowly take more than they're supposed to. And that's the office space, what I call the office space attack. And that's the type of thing we, we, we stress test. Because those are trading strategies, right? A good trading strategy finds that loophole and slowly takes all the money. And that's the type of thing you may not want in your decentralized exchange. So I guess that's a that's a good differentiator from you guys from like more traditional auditing companies. But how, are you familiar with the block science team and what they do? Uh, it, yes, more or less. What What would you say makes you guys unique? in comparison to them. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, we come at these types of things from the uh, more of like a, a infrastructure and finance view of this rather than kind of a uh, 
more like high level game theoretical version of the world where you try to make this like really complicated model of the system that doesn't interact with the real code and is but you try to like solve it in a more fancy way mm -hmm. um i think we spend a lot of time time on building these things as trading strategies and yeah. making sure that you get the execution correct uh in trading is 80 percent of your pnl like really understanding for instance the the distribution of, of latencies of packet arrival times uh is the difference between you losing a hundred million dollars and making a hundred million dollars um, yeah and so we spend a lot of time on on making sure we execute the code exactly as it's run on nodes um, making sure that the models themselves are aware of low level blockchain details and like you know things like things like how fast they're getting packets understanding the mempool understanding gas bidding um, and so we focus more on these like low level details than we do on like hey here's a differential game that may or may not have a stable nash and do you converge to it or not um you can argue that the me the methodology that we choose can get stuck in local minima more easily um but at the same time i would say that it is more practical because it can provide you more direct uh feedback and you know it's completely modeled off how people do this in trading where you know you have these really the simulation environments that are exactly the same as like the live trading environment and you constantly running simulations as your trading strategy is running live to say like predict whether you should turn things off or whether you should like size up or stuff like that and it's not perfect it's not theoretically perfect like i can i can give you lots of examples where this type of methodology doesn't get you to the global optimum but from an engineer standpoint, it's much more practical. Like you can know when like a certain malformed transaction causes a catastrophic loss versus like, I know that in this high level model that doesn't ever interact with the real blockchain, there is some potential bug that that could exist. So I, I think, we, you know, we just try to focus on being like really more on the engineering side and like infrastructure side versus kind of here's a differential game that you're mm -hmm. trying to solve. So I don't think you said like the, the term that I usually associate with Gauntlet is uh, agent simulation. I don't think yeah. you, you actually ah. <laughs> said that those words yet. So maybe, maybe like, cause that's what's happening, right? And how you're exploring these smart contract systems. So tell us a bit about that, please. Yeah, for sure. So, so in agent based simulation, yeah. And thanks. That's, that's a very good point. I think, uh, Agent-based simulation is basically taking different models of the different types of users, and you know, if we're if we're going to take the simplest version of this, uh, each user has two types of parameters. Number one is sort of a profit or utility function, which measures how much uh, how they value certain things in the system. Like it may there might be one type of user who is super risk averse, and they value lending in Compound much more than they value borrowing in Compound because they don't like taking leverage. They like their utility comes from earning 1% slowly. And then there are degen gambler type of people who all their utility comes from just like borrowing as much as possible and like betting it on FOMO 3D or something. I don't know. Um, and so the and, degen gamblers, they're not even really rational, but they might stumble across something. Is that correct? Yeah, so so that, that's a good point. So the, the idea is, you know, you model things in, in two ways. One is this utility or profit, and one is the decision function. And the decision function uh, in, in, in classical econometrics, for instance, is the thing that says, hey, pull the slot machine lever or go spend it on poker or go invest it in a, you know, a bond. It, it's the thing that represents the actions that you actually take. And in our case, uh, and this is something, again, I think we, we differ quite a bit from block science, but there's our actions are the actual smart contract transactions and interacting with the real code, interacting with the blockchain itself uh, versus like interacting with a fake version that's like idealized. Um, and uh, you, you now have many of these agents uh, interacting with the same blockchain or the same smart contract, and they each have different utility functions and decision functions. So 
one of them is like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to be happiest if I lend to compound. Another one's like, hey, I'm going to be happiest if I borrow a lot and default in compound because I'll I have this shit coin and I would rather have dollars so I can deposit into compound, borrow stable coins against it and say goodbye shit coin without having to do KYC. Um, and you run many of these simulations of like these different types of users uh, and and try to get some statistics of, of, oh, does this type of user take most of the profit? Does this type of user have a lot of variance in their profit? Um, but a really key thing to this is that in distributed systems and cryptography, I'd say the majority of, of papers uh, spend a, a, a lot of time uh, working on this model of people are either per, per, perfectly honest or they're Byzantine. And this gets to your point of the, what you were saying in terms of degen gamblers. Are the degen gamblers really Byzantine? Uh, and in reality, they're probably not because most of the assumption of Byzantine in, in distributed systems and, 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 and Byzantine general problem and stuff like that really assumes that Byzantine means any action that someone can take in a memoryless way. They're not, there's no like, there's no uh, assumption that at each round of, of say like a vote in the Byzantine system, someone doesn't like use the, how effective their previous strategy was to influence their future strategy. If you read these proofs, people always prove these things, assuming kind of this memorylessness. They don't actually assume that they're, I mean, now people do care a little bit about these adaptive strategies, but the, the traditional canon in distributed systems, and I think this is one of the reasons why Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies took so long to be invented, even though they're kind of simpler in some sense, like uh, it's because people like drilled it into their head that there's this model of purely honest and purely Byzantine. These degen gamblers, while they are Byzantine, they still learn from their previous mistakes, right? They're still trying to optimize their wealth somehow, and they need to have memory of their previous actions. And so rational agents, Unfortunately, it's a much bigger space than honest and business. Uh, you, you know, it, 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 to a very particular theoretical sense, it's this infinite dimensional space, but it, it, it's, a, it's a large set of strategies and you can, you only have a finite amount of time to stress test those. So you want to cover as many of those as possible while also being able to be computationally feasible. Um, and that's, that's, that's the art, I'd say, of, of these agent based models is really knowing how to cover the state space and parameterize it effectively, even though you know it's this infinite dimensional thing with sharp P complete problems everywhere. So how do you go about doing these simulations? What tools do you use? Have you guys written your own custom stuff or? Yeah, so we, we have a little, we, we basically, you know, forked Geth and, and Parity and like wrote a bunch of custom uh, stuff for, for, for ETH. Uh, most of the reasons for, for really having to build your own or fork a lot of the stuff in the client is when you're running these uh, closed simulation environments, you want to remove a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily need. Um, excuse me, for instance, like you actually don't want to verify signatures. Why? You're controlling the entire environment and you are you're defining all the users interacting with the system and you're going to spend most of your wall clock time in CPU running your signature generation. So why not just give people unique IDs and pretend it's trusted because you're, you're defining kind of all the users in the system. Uh, another reason is that you may actually want to modify uh, gas costs and see how under different gas models or under something like EIP 1559, like how, how that changes behavior in in gas auctions and, and stuff like that, and so, so a lot of the economics is actually embedded quite low in the in the clients. It's not this emergent type of thing, and so you want to you want to control that. Other optimizations, the way you have I/O and communication between the agents, uh, they might send side channel messages and stuff like that, and you want to make sure you optimize that. And the last thing is you need to model the external market. So these agents are interacting with the blockchain, but they also are trading on Coinbase. They're also uh, interacting potentially with other chains, but in our current environment, it's not like that. So we've built our own environment. You can think of this like OpenAI gym or uh, any of these like sort of reinforcement learning 
playgrounds, uh, but customized around how you interact with blockchains. And so our tooling is is, is based on that stack. Uh, you know, I when I when, because I guess I spent ten years in, in trading and, and the basic stuff. You know, I wrote everything in C plus um, plus. Of course, my co-founder was like, let's rewrite everything in Rust. So most of our stuff now is is like kind of Rust and Go. But we also have this sort of domain specific language uh, that's in Python because data scientists only want to use Python. I, 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 you're never going to find someone who's like, oh, I'd love to write Rust as much as the, yeah, you know, yeah. Rust fanboys are out there saying that like you can do all your numerics in Rust. Find me a data scientist who's not going to embrace it. And so, so we have Python bindings that we compile. Uh, for both the C++ Rust and Go side. So the data scientist sees something that looks like PyTorch and they can basically script the, the strategies that there. And then from there, you know, it runs on like a cluster, just some normal like Kubernetes type of thing. And you can run, you know, thousands of jobs and and, and, and get the results. So so the idea is like you, you the simulations are, a lot of it is centered around abstracting certain things about the client away, optimizing yeah. the client, and then making a DSL for interacting with that. Yeah. So so I gather you have pretty much software which is similar to Block Science CAD CAD, but as you previously mentioned, the difference of what you guys are doing is you're testing it with the actual blockchain. You're yes. like not abstracting away this entire environment. Is this stuff open source? Can I play around with this if I want to? It, it is not. Uh, we... We we're working on open sourcing some of it, which just okay. I think it's it's most of our. <laughs> I, I think we're at the at the current current state. We're just we've just been like really doing focusing on more doing these sort of audit uh, like yeah. things. And just haven't really had time. Yeah, I guess a lot of the time when you end up writing tooling for yourself, the code is terrible, and then you have to open source it and have to actually like clean shit up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I get that, but but you guys are aiming at open sourcing some of these things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's um, awesome too. Right? I, yeah, I I think uh, it's it's also like we're, we're we've we do want to support another virtual machine at some point. Uh, so we're also trying to abstract some of the ETH, partic- ETH specific stuff out. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's not not quite at that. I think at that point, that's like a good point to open source because we'll have to clean up a lot of stuff. Yeah. In order. Just like one one really specific kind of question uh, is like, does it, you know, when you, so you're like looking at the application layer and smart contracts, uh, but are, are you know do you take into account uh, like front running and and even like a chain reorg involving front running? I don't know if you saw it, and it's a bit hard to explain in audio, but like this really cool dice to win attack that happened a little while ago. Like, do you think that that your agents would have stumbled across that? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. So we do model some aspects of consensus. So we separate, uh, but the, usually the consensus model is not the exact code um, for a bunch of reasons. One is is the wall clock time of running the real consensus code is forever because you're there's just tons of like timeouts and network delays and like the actual way that these clients implement like peer-to-peer networking means that if you try to run the real consensus code, you'll end up spending almost the real wall clock time. And your goal in simulation is always to make simulate the ratio of simulation time to wall clock time as high as possible because you want to get the most samples as possible. The more samples you have, the more statistical confidence you have, and the more you trust these numbers. Um, and the uh, the some of the consensus components we 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 do simulate. Um, I would say on ETH we don't usually simulate consensus. I think for for protocols that uh, have more of their incentives connected to consensus, we do so like. We've done a lot of simulations of Celo, and Celo uh, is an is an East fork, um, but they have basically they've taken Geth and they've stripped out the consensus pieces of Geth and put in a proof of stake uh, consensus, implemented as a smart contract. So it's similar to Move and Libra that way, and 
in that situation, we actually do we we do model kind of like the the forking behavior and also the the interaction of the application layer with uh, staking. Um, so I don't know if we would have exactly got the Daisu in thing. We do model the mempool, and then we also have models for how if I send like we you know I think we 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 have a model for like the networking of if if I have a hundred agents, um, what's the distribution of latencies that they have until they hit the first miner? Or like in the peer to peer gossip network, how many hops do they do they go through? Um, so we, we have some high level models of that, and those do capture a little bit of of this forking behavior. But I don't think we can have these kind of gigantic reorg uh, situations in our simulation. Um, but one reason I bring up the uh, the incentive alignment is, uh, you know, I think we, we wrote this paper last year, late last year, uh, that was presented at, uh, at the Stanford blockchain conference that shows that, um, these applications can actually in, in, interfere quite a bit with consensus in proof of stake in a way that's much harder than they can in proof of work, where if you have a, a lending protocol, say like compound on on a proof of stake network, if the yields on compound are way higher than the staking yields, then people will be incentivized to unbond and move all their staked assets into the lending vehicle. And the question is, is it possible for there to be more than 50% of stake in the lending vehicle so that 51% attacks become cheaper than attacking the, the lending smart contract? And so that paper kind of shows that there are conditions under which that will happen, where basically, depending on how you structure the monetary policy, for certain monetary policies, it's actually, you're inevitably going to have this thing where, let's say it's a Bitcoin monetary policy, it gets super deflationary. Eventually, validators say, look, I'm getting no rewards, no new rewards. I'm just going to move all my money into lending, and then the network becomes easy to attack. So we studied those very carefully, because those are... I think those are the cases that are extremely important. And in, this is, I think, fundamentally where proof of stake and proof of work differ is that proof of stake really is first a first class financial object, which means that it's competing with the things running on it. Um, and so, yeah, we, if that answers your question, we, we do, we do care a lot about that when that happens, because that, 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 that can be a very catastrophic type of. I think so let's talk about everyone's favorite discussion again, a bit of DeFi. Do you, what's your current take on it? We talked a bit briefly about it, but do you think the things which are happening right now are being done responsibly enough? Do you think most of the protocols that are out there should be doing um, agent-based simulations with you guys? What's your thought on that? Yeah, so I think in DeFi, it definitely matters more. Uh as I said, proof of stake so far has been this weird exchange game of like how much stake can a single exchange get? And, you know, it, it ossifies. And sometimes like once there's an exchange that has like 30% of stake, they basically never vote on any of the governance things because all of them are adverse to them. They're like, oh, this is, you need to think more. And like, you don't get, people don't change them very much. So I think the modeling doesn't matter if it's basically centralized. <laughs> You know, as much as people want to say, oh, DeFi is not decentralized, it has way more users than any of these proof of stake networks. And they're, it, it's not even close in some sense. Um, I think the cool thing about uh, DeFi is that you have a lot more transparency into uh, when everything is blowing up. And so I'll give you an analogy. Uh, in the financial crisis, uh, you know, everyone's favorite villain is mortgage-backed securities. But in mortgage-backed securities, one of the reasons that the blow-up was even more catastrophic than it should have been is that there's not much transparency into when mortgage-backed securities are mispriced. And the reason for this is, let's say you own a home, you're you're paying you're paying your your your, your mortgage, and all of a sudden you're like you lose your job, and you say, okay, I'm not going to make my interest payment. I'm going to make the principal payments because I can. You know, the law lets you pay your interest later with extra fees. And then you're still in a bad time and you're like, okay, I can't pay my principal payment. 
And then you say, okay, I, uh, I, you know, I default. Then the bank that underwrote that or the mortgage issuer has to say, okay, this, this mortgage defaulted. Um, and then legally they have to tell all the people they sold the securities to, Hey, this mortgage defaulted. And then only then can you be like, Oh, the price of this security should reflect the fact that the defaults happened. That whole procedure takes six months and you have no clue when the default actually impacts the price. And mm -hmm. there's tons of principal agent problems that are not, uh, you can't, all participants can't observe. DeFi is basically still making mortgage backed securities. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves about this. Yeah. Uh, it's basically the same thing, but the price reflects the fact that the information propagates almost immediately. And I think that is a big source of, of loss. That's an improvement. Um, it, it's maybe a nuanced improvement, but I think the, the transparency actually does help you ensure that the price, the price reflects the true risk yeah. faster. And, and so that to me is a fundamental innovation uh, compared to normal finance. Like you yeah. do in normal finance, there's a lot of reasons that people can try to hide information from the market and that doesn't get priced. Yeah. And I think that, that, that to me is like where, what keeps me really interested in this stuff is like, it's just, it's so different. I, I get that part, part about the whole transparency and how that makes a fundamental difference to these products. But I often feel like that is kind of an excuse by the protocol builders to build shittier products because they then say, Oh, it's transparent. If people like if shit blows up, everyone can see, but it also assumes that the actors participating are able to interpret the information correctly, which I think there's like a big gap between the amount of people using DeFi and the people who actually understand the protocols enough to be able to make like the nuanced um, decision on whether something is priced in or not. For sure. Um, so I, that's where I think simulation is super useful is, you know, you can, you can give people who may not totally understand all of these details, a, an idea of what the ROI looks like and how different strategies perform with the smart contract. And under what conditions is profitable, not profitable, under what conditions you're holding a lot of risk. Uh, and I think simulation is, is the way to bridge kind of the gap between I wrote the contract and I know what transactions it's emitting to, hey, I'm a, I'm a user who's like, I want some yield and I'm willing to take some risk, but I'm not willing to take this much risk. And here's, here's my preferences. Encode my preferences into a, an agent and run these simulations and say like, that's what that's, this is how it will operate. I definitely think that's, that's the direction that things will go. And that's the direction that normal finance already is. So when you, you know, you go to your 401k in the US, you'll see these like Monte Carlo outcomes of like, oh, if you choose this mutual fund, this is like the average performance. This is like what you, the best case, worst case, and they'll give you all. And people have already internalized all these simulations that hide a lot of details of like how the arbitrage loops and ETFs work or how the funding rate are works at the end of the day, every day, or like why their mutual fund, you know, how the NAV uh, rebalances itself daily, stuff like that. Uh, and I think crypto feels like it's going to go that direction. It just isn't, it's like the 1980s right now. Yeah. So, so do you think for like DeFi to get more mature, it would make sense for protocols to not only have all these simulations done, but open source them and provide like step by step processes for people using these products and how to interpret all the information that is taken into account? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think they're starting to, to do much more of that. I think, um, like for instance, uh, balancers UX, uh, so balancer, for a little background is, is sort of a, a, a Uniswap uh, you know, automated market maker, but it uh, has a different curve and it, it lets you have portfolios of assets. So instead of trading ETH for DAI, you can hold a portfolio, kind of like an ETF of ETH, DAI, Maker, some other shitcoin. I don't know. I, I can't think of enough names in my head, <laughs> but some portfolio. Um, and they actually have a tiny little PNL simulator. Now, is it a very accurate, like, detail thing that will make? No, but it, 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 it's, it's the first time I've seen something that looks like these, 
the things that you see in normal finance when you go to a 401k or to Betterment or Wealthfront or any of these fintech products that you people invest in, where it gives you some prediction, some kind of high level thing of like, oh, if you make this action, this is what outcomes you might have. And I think part of it is open sourcing the simulation, but part of it is also UX. I, I actually think you have to find a way to present those things so yeah. that people don't roll their, don't glaze their eyes over and say like, this is too much content. Yeah. Um, but, but you're starting to see that in, in, in the, in, and I think it's just like, you know, I, I tend to really think crypto reminds me of like how markets looked like in, uh, the, the kind of nineties and eighties where, where basically people, especially, especially when it, if you, especially in the sense of, uh, you know, in, in the nineties, there was uh, there were a lot of people running exchanges so so once the internet existed people just started uh building exchanges in their house uh you know it, it sounds crazy but there were there's was, there's was a guy in west virginia who had like 30 percent of equities volume uh in, in 1995 uh from some you know exchange he built sitting out sitting in his basement it it's reminiscent of like 2015 and Bitcoin were like people were running exchanges out of their basement in some sense, right? There were there Quadriga was literally, I mean, it's a bad example in some ways, but Quadriga was literally just a guy in his basement, right? For a while. Uh, but as a Canadian, that one hurts. <laughs> <laughs> um. uh, and basically, what happened was over time, like the incumbents started like compete. You had this thing where you had thousands of exchanges. And then uh, that fragmented liquidity so much that people started consolidating. And once they consolidated, the consolidation led to kind of these uh, this oligopoly, which looks like what the Coinbase, Binance, BitMEX, Bybit, you know, whatever, like, you know, the 20, 20 people who, are, who have most of the volume. Uh, and then there was kind of eventually a, a reaction to that. And you have all these fintech products. Uh, that hide that from the end user, like Robinhood. End user doesn't even know what exchange they're buying stock on anymore. And this huge distributed systems problem of there's thousands of exchanges, people need to figure out that there's a law called uh, Reg NMS. This is all the US, sorry, so I should, should caveat this. That says that if someone wants to buy a share of Apple, you as the broker have to go to every exchange and say, find the best price possible and sell it to them at the best price. If you don't, you are fined by the SEC. Um, and this national best bid and offer guarantee basically destroyed all human brokers. It, 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 it basically said, hey, there's hundreds of exchanges. And if you incorrectly report the best price, you get fined. So all it did was create this kind of high frequency trading industry to basically optimize price discovery and sending prices everywhere. Uh, and that led to the Robin Hood of the world because that basically killed all the banks from, from market making. And it made it such that buying data was more important than having relationships. Uh, and like crypto is kind of has a similar thing, except instead of buying data, it's like, you know, people don't trust their government and they'd rather, you know, go down this, this rabbit hole. But I, this consolidation and then kind of alternative uh, end user interface type of thing is what I see with CFI and DeFi, where it's like there are a bunch of exchanges, they consolidate, there are a few exchanges, and then there's this network of like market makers and, and mar market participants who are inventing a user interface such that the end user has no clue, doesn't, ha doesn't actually know what they're interacting with. And I, I see a lot of similarities in, in crypto in that way. I think there's there's going to be it's going to be so abstracted to the end user that there's no difference to them between buying a share of Apple and buying Bitcoin, right? Robinhood's trying to do it, but they're not really doing that. With, their crypto product makes no sense. So, so I guess you, I mean, one of the things I think implicit in Dean's first question about DeFi. Uh, is I think he sees it as kind of a shit show, Wild West. Um, do you see it professionalizing and like sort of becoming more uh, stable, reliable, 
Uh, let's see about money. I um, think. The, <laughs> I think maybe it's because I was burned in the early days of Bitcoin in 2011 and 13 and interacted with really shitty exchanges in which I lost, I've lost at least, well, I mean, at that time. So this was just embarrassing, but like I lost at least like 10 to 20 Bitcoin at that time to, to basically exchanges that just got shut down or like disappeared and stole my money and exit scam. I, I think that. You're just callous. Like you just, it's got to happen to everybody at some point when they're when they weighed in. It's, it's your I, yeah, yeah. Well, it was just yeah, it was just painful. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it's like a little better than that era, at least. Like yes, it's harder to reason about. But man, the scam artists in 2011 and 13, like to 13, were just like unreal. Like everyone was brazenly just trying to take take your 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 coins and like doing everything possible to 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 take your keys away from you yeah. um i think while DeFi is a shit show there are clearly things that seem to be an improvement uh and i think you're, you'll see consolidation around those um the question the the i don't think i, I think in the same way that there's like Hundreds of people saying, like, I'm running a Bitcoin exchange to now there's like 20. You're going to see the same thing where there's going to be thousands of there's going to be a 2017 of DeFi stuff. I don't know what shape that comes in, whether it means there's a lot of capital that goes in or whether it means there's just like millions of projects, most of which are useless. Um, but there's going to be something like that. And then whatever sticks from that is going to become the Coinbase of finance. Uh, and I think it's going to end up just consolidating because people don't want to trust their capital in too many places and you know i think that's why compound and maker kind of have these liquidity moats is that people kind of trust their contracts for better or worse even in spite of black thursday people just trust them a lot more uh than than the next second best option it's really a like lock-in effect and to some extent i think that that that's a little bit of what happens is happening for ethereum i i remember i got into this space being like or like full-time working in this being like, oh, there's like all these famous professors and there's all these like really smart people uh, working on building these competitors and whatever. But it's pretty clear, I think, to me that none of the other layer ones really have a serious chance. Uh, I, I think they're all going to end up being layer twos for Ethereum at some level. That's a whole huge other topic, I feel like. Yeah, <laughs> it's to keep it on track. Well, we'll I'll, let Dean, I'll let Dean go ahead. So you say, you, yeah, you say that there's going to be this uh, another 2017, but just for DeFi. To to me, it feels like we're already there because in 2017, what we saw is a bunch of people selling ICOs, saying that they're changing the world. Whereas now we have DeFi, where everyone's like, oh, we're giving all these financial products to people who need them. Whereas to me, it looks like essentially just a bunch of white dudes who are traders getting richer off of instruments that they're pumping themselves. Yeah. I think the, the, the difference was there was no, you didn't have to, you didn't have to prove anything in 2017. <laughs> like the Brock Pierce's of the world were able to, to sell stuff without by selling their lifestyle and not like selling something that a piece of code that was able to manage capital. Hey dude, he's in the mighty ducks. He's legit. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I do distinctly remember this party I was at in New York in 2015 or 16. And he was like selling EOS to a bunch of people who were on psychedelics. And it was like, <laughs> a, like hilarious. It was like, I don't see that. That happening. sounds like Brock Pierce. <laughs> It was definitely not the it was definitely not the type of thing I think that like the DeFi bros will be able to do. They they don't have the charisma of uh, of, of the Mighty Ducks. They don't have the marketers of that 2017 era. It's but, like but too it's, annoying for people to understand. I do agree with you that it's it's kind of rich yeah. people getting richer. There's no there's no there's no getting around that. Yeah, I, I always laugh whenever people are like, "Oh, we're solving finance." Like people are going to take a DeFi loan to to buy a house and i'm like no no they're not this is just traders trading the people who take DeFi loans to buy their house already have enough crypto that 
is worth yeah. more than their house to borrow against. Yes, <laughs> right. so they should have just sold their crypto, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess maybe. It, it's definitely, it's definitely, it's definitely not like this bank the unbanked. Uh, yeah, a lot of, of the things just aren't really capital efficient either, if that's the right term to use. For sure, I think that that's improving though. That's the thing where I'm, I'm a little more hopeful that we will do better than the normal finance industry because the lack of capital efficiency is actually quite, quite a bit of the source of inequality. Yeah. Um, in that. If you if it takes more capital to extract a certain profit, but but like only ten percent of people have enough capital to do it, then those ten percent of people will be taking that block reward, so to speak, uh, from that that instrument, and no one else can can join. Um, I I like to say the the arbitrage is the proof of work of DeFi, right? Like you can only kind of like extract a DeFi profit if you can like actually prove to the protocol that you did an arbitrage. In some yeah. Sense. And I think that's a fundamental difference than ICOs because ICOs arbitrage was, do you trust hooded man giving you psychedelics that tells you to buy, put a million dollars into EOS? You know, what I mean? yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's a little bit harder. Now, yeah. will there be scams? Of course, but you know, it's 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 some improvement. I think the hardest part for DeFi is they, there's no way to do credit, right? Yeah. There's no identity. There's no uh, right. there's no identity, and there's no there's no there's no way to do unsecured or undersecured at least yeah. lending, right? And until until someone solves identity, which is a much that is the banking the unbanked that crypto needs more than more than like being able to give people loans is like finding a good decentralized identity notion that still preserves yeah. privacy somebody will just put a token on it though they'll just be like oh here's your here's your uh social credit tokens here's you your id coin collateral yeah <laughs> uh, well i mean i guess this is why i added the privacy caveat like somehow you have to find a way to to give you know yeah. a, an anonymous identification that can generate zero knowledge proofs of certain qualities of the owner without having to uh, leak things over time. The problem is just like you can't really privacy coins have to be built, assuming that the transaction graph can be identified. The any digital identification system has to make sure it it doesn't leak information based on the number of queries that it's made. Because like mm -hmm. if I make a bunch of queries and someone can identify that transaction graph, then I'm screwed. But transaction graph mixing is probably the most difficult technical problem i think that exists in in, in crypto maybe, maybe that you guys might disagree on i don't know i don't know how you feel about that but i think that's the biggest hurdle to ever doing these decentralized id that is also private do, do you think that you can have the um you know you, you talked about the benefits of DeFi. one of the things being transparency and so being publicly visible that you know things are being repriced for example can you get some kind of like that sort of public auditability in some way in in a balance with some form of privacy, confidential transactions, or or does introducing uh, does introducing that through something like an Aztec or uh, like I know that there's actually like more of a spectrum of privacy and confidentiality with various technologies, but is there some mix of that that also allows you to have the right level of auditability and public visibility into the uh, activities? Yeah, I think that, the, again, all of these things boil down to somehow forcing the transaction graph. Like you can do all the zero knowledge proof stuff and make a single transaction anonymous. Like I'm going to say, perfect. You, 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 you've, you've, you've figured out how to optimize FRI. You figured out how to uh you know compress your circuit really fast you figured out how to do all the optimizations and bells and whistles to make your zero knowledge proof work the problem is that's just a single transaction and mixing the transaction graph in such a way that you can still identify that something is true without leaking information over time i just don't know exactly how you solve that like there's 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 some fundamental limit in nature to how there's trade offs between like number of interactions I make with the system versus how private each of those interactions is. And like the more interactions I make, 
even if they're private. Each time I have to be revealing some information to the system. And I think that the only way to really do that is to somehow like throw away IDs a lot and, and do this mixing type of thing on the transaction graph itself. And, but the problem with that is like the computational complexity of that grows way too quickly. Um, but I do think that there is, there is some way of, there must be some way of doing a zero knowledge proof on the transaction graph that itself, the whole transaction graph for all people that gives you a, that like can, can do that. I just think that we're very far technically from that, uh, universe where that happens. I, and, and people are, I feel like people are really working towards that. It's, it's just like, that feels to me like a 20 year goal of like true transaction graph blinding. I think the other thing is in the privacy coin space, there's just like a lot of claims that people make that are, I would say, undersubstantiated, right? Like we've seen so many of these empirical attacks on Vcash and Monero um, that it is it is very clear that like it's really good to get single step transaction privacy working, but yeah, you somehow have to deal with this this temporal aspect um, if you want to get all of the things you were you were saying uh, to work and. Yeah, I, I, I just think there is some fundamental lower bound of like, you can't have more than a certain number of interactions before you start leaking some information. There's some information mm -hmm. theoretic bound, right? Like that says, and once we understand that, then we can design systems that try to like keep yourself saturated as like, so that's as private as possible. So that's right, that right. Is. So like, I mean, perhaps guide you, like your, your personal assistant, whatever, say, hey, it's time to use some new addresses or something like rotate your your addresses yeah exactly mm -hmm. like there, there needs to be some type of thing that like you can yourself monitor that you have leaked x like some bits of information and you say like i'm comfortable leaking this many bits and if i'm not then i have to go get a new id like okay. i think somehow that has to be built into the ux of how people use these systems if you want them to be truly private yeah that's a that's a really fascinating question um, be interesting to see where things go with that. So I think, uh, I think we're, we're at time and, uh, this is where we sort of start to wrap up and say, thank you very much. And maybe tell people where they can follow you and, and learn more about you and, and watch your work as it evolves. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, my Twitter is, is, uh, is my name, Karun Chitra. And, uh, yeah, you can, we, we write a lot of papers and uh, blog posts uh, at gauntlet.network and uh, yeah, just send me messages whenever. Uh, I'm happy to, happy, to, happy to talk to any of this stuff. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. It was, it was really great.